This interview, Ken Norman, who is an ex-RAF buccaneer and camera pilot, shares his stories about flying the two types. He includes squadrons, which are 31, 16 and 208. He also gives a great insight into flying the buccaneer over at Red Flag at Nellis Air Force Base. So please subscribe and enjoy. My father was in the Air Force, but it never occurred to me to be a pilot. In fact, uh, I went to boarding school I, when I was 16, I left after my O-levels and I joined the Merchant Navy. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I did a four-year apprenticeship with Elder Dempster Lines, uh, two years in Liverpool at Livers Riversdale Technical College, doing an OND in marine engineering, and then a year at sea, followed by a year at college again, so it was a four-year apprenticeship. So what happened after that? Well, I, I did uh, two trips to sea, the first one down to Nigeria, and uh, the second one to Burma, that's Myanmar now, I think, and Rangoon, I think it's called Yangon now. Um, and I was getting a bit disillusioned, I have to say, with it being at sea. It's not what I expected to be. I wanted to travel and see the world and be an engineer. But unfortunately, working on an engine room of some of the ships I was on was a bit of a nightmare, to say the least. So I was looking to, uh, for another career. And after my second trip, I came back to Shawbury. That's where my father was stationed at the time, Shawbury. And uh, I bumped into an old friend of mine, a young lady who had a boyfriend with her, a boyfriend of a chap called Kevin Mace. And I asked him what he did, and he said, I'm a pilot in the Air Force. I said, oh, really? I said, uh, well, what sort of airplanes are you flying? He said, well, I'm going through training at Valley at the moment, flying the NAT. So I was quite interested, so I asked him about what the qualifications were for the Royal Air Force. And uh, I dashed off home, got an application form for the Air Force, and I fired it off. And I put a covering letter in it saying, I'll be back at sea for three months, going back to Burma again. If we get an interview, could I come down after three months? So when I got back after that trip, waiting for me at the, uh, when I got home, was a letter from the Air Force saying, come along for an interview, for a three-day interview. So I immediately rushed off and bought the Know Your Own IQ uh, book, where you can actually go through all the IQ -Q tests to give you a bit of a heads up for the interview. And I went down to Biggin Hill for three days and it went quite well. I mean, the usual tests, the leadership tests and the IQ tests and the, the coordination tests and finally the interview. And at the interview, they said to me, uh, obviously you want to be a pilot, but what's your second choice? And I said, well, I don't have a second choice. They said, well, you must put a second choice down. So I said, well, my second choice is staying in the Merchant Navy. So uh, I left and went home again. I thought maybe I'd been a bit cheeky there. But anyway, I went, left and went uh, back to sea again. And I went, uh, this voyage was down to Nigeria, down to Sapoli. And we were picking up Sapoli pine in Sapoli, loaded onto the ship. Well, I got a telex uh, from a father saying, congratulations, Ken, you start the Royal Air Force as a pilot, 8th September, 1966. So it was superb. You know, there were two things to celebrate there, really. One was that uh, I was joining the Air Force, and the other one was that I didn't have to go back to bloody Nigeria again. <laughs> So could you tell us when your uh, training started? Yeah. It started uh, 8th of September 66. And surprisingly, I didn't go to, to uh, South Cerny, which is the initial training school. I went north to Murray Sea School. Um, the uh, a a Air Force decided to send me for a month outward bound, which is a bit uh, bizarre, really. I just left the Merchant Navy, and I was going to the Sea School when I joined the Royal Air Force. But I had 28 days there, and it was fabulous. You know, it was one of those, you know, sort of uh, outward bound that everyone wants to do. You know, he did uh, sailing. We'd get up in the morning, in fact. We'd get up in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, and we would uh, run for three miles, and then come back for a hearty breakfast, then go down the docks and sail the cutter or we'd, uh, in the kayaks or, or the canoes. So we'd spend a lot of time down the docks. Or we'd go up into hills and we'd be doing mountain climbing, we'd doing rock climbing, abseiling, and we'd spend a bit of time actually uh, walking and camping in the Cairngorm. So it was incredible, 28 days. I loved it, you know, and it was w well worth doing. So could you tell us what aircraft you trained on? Yes, I mean, obviously, initially did the well, eight, 10 week course at South Cerny, which is just officer, officer training school, and then went to uh, Church Fenton to fly the chipmunk. What was that like? Uh, that was an intensive course. That was it, was. it was 30 hours flying in about 30 days. So you, you flew sometimes three times a day. Uh, uh, it, was, it was a lovely airplane to fly. I mean, initially when you first flew the course, it was, it was a bit of a fiddly airplane to land. It was a, 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 a tailwheel airplane, so you had to land it in, the, in a three-point attitude. Um, but once you got that hacked and uh, a bit of circuit training, then we're off doing general handling. 
and the general handling was just generally obviously a bit of yes. steep turns etc but we started doing aerobatics and of course that's when it was a lovely airplane to fly you know loops barrels stall turns it's just a great airplane Sarston obviously that's the your wings course and it's about I think it's about 11 months the course was and um, it was a lovely airplane to fly it was a straight wing airplane uh, all manual controls uh, and the course initially of course was was just general handling you you did circuit training and uh, learning to land the aeroplane, which is actually a lot easier to land than the chipmunk. Um, and then, say, upper air work, and then, say, an instant rating, a white rating you'd do, that meant you could fly in all sorts of weathers. And then from there, we started doing nav X's, medium level nav X's, and then onto formation flying, and obviously onto aerobatics, which I loved. And to me, it is important that uh, you do as much aerobatics as possible because you got streamed after, after basic training, either onto uh, Oakington, which, which for, was for uh, transport aircraft, or to Valley, which is a, is a fast jet, really. So in my mind, it's important to turn the airplane upside down as often, as often as possible. And I remember one of the last trips I did, I was flying with standards, OC standards, and he, and he briefed me that we'll get airborne, and we'll do general handling, and we'll do QGH, as I did, as I did. And when we got airborne, he said, Ken, what do you want to do? And I said, aerobatics. And he says, fine. And he showed me his aerobatic sequence. And then uh, I did mine, and we spent hours doing aer aerobatics. And when we came into land, he says, where do you want to go, Ken? I said, oh, Valley. He says, well, we'll see what happens. And I subsequently got posted to Valley. So I uh, arrived at Valley, which is a, a great place to be in, uh, in, in Anglesey. I uh, parked the car and immediately walked down to the end of the runway. I started watching the airplanes land. I couldn't believe I'd finally arrived at the Valley to fly the Nat. Uh, the course... Uh, Initially, it was a, a lot of ground school. The Nat was quite a more complicated aeroplane. It had power controls and, and uh, hydraulic controls, etc. So we spent a time in the ground school learning about the Nat, and then we did, I think, about 10 sessions in the simulator before we flew the aeroplane. And the Nat was a delight. I mean, you walked out of the aeroplane, yeah, and as they always said, you don't actually strap into, strap into a Nat, you actually put it on. And it was like that. It was, it was just a tiny little aeroplane. And the nice thing about it was that it was a tandem seating, so when you got into the aeroplane, you sat there and there was nobody else with you. <laughs> so you always felt that you were, you were flying solo. So uh, at the end of the course, uh, I did quite well, I suppose, and I was actually posted onto Harriers. Okay, can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, yeah initial posting on Harriers, and um, a couple of my mates went to, onto Lightnings. But before I left uh, Valley, I was informed that um, the Harrier course had been delayed in enormously because they had problems with the Harrier. So they said, would you do a short, a short course on the, on the Canberra? I said, yeah, no problem at all. I loved it. I, I'd been what, training then for about three years, so I was quite keen to get on a squadron. So off I went to, uh, to uh, Cottesmore to join the, the, the Canberra OCU. Um, a bit of a culture shock, to say the least. <laughs> it had come from the Nat to the Canberra. The Canberra, of course, had no power controls at all. It had, I think, hydraulics for the raising the undercarriage, and I think maybe for the air brakes, I think. But the rest uh, was all manual controls. And uh, I remember the wheel brakes were actually air driven, I think. They were a very strange system. Anyway, the first time I, I got into uh, the T4, you'd, you'd go in the T4, which is the one around the corner there, and you'd strap in, and uh, you can see the big bubble canopy. Well, there's a great feeling that when you're in there, because you're to the left hand side of the cockpit, you had your head to one side like this, you know. And then the instructor would get in, and his seat was folded right back, um, and he would pull, pull the seat forward, and then strap in, and then take the, take the uh, p pins out. And uh, so we, we started the... <laughs> The engines, and I said the, the brakes on the, on the camera were, were air brakes. So the way you operated the, the brakes, there was no nose or steering. You would put the rudder on and you'd squeeze the paddle on the, on the control wheel and the brakes would come on and you'd just turn the airplane that way. But it was, it was a bit fierce and I remember <laughs> taxiing down the taxiway with a head like this and every time I put the brakes on, we're, we're doing this all the way down the, the taxiway. And I thought to myself, I can't even steer this bloody thing, and he expects you to fly it. <laughs> so we, we taxed out eventually and got airborne. Um, and it was fabulous, you know, got airborne. It was a delight to fly. It was one of those aeroplanes. It was, it, it was just a gentleman's aeroplane, really. A big wing, big straight wing aeroplane, manual controls, and it was great. Loved, loved flying the Canberra.
So can you tell us a bit about your first flight in the Canberra? Well, so that was the first flight. and there was a, In fact, the more interesting fl flight was about four, four trips later that I explained to you that the instructor gets into the, into the aeroplane and he, he brings his seat forward. But on my fourth trip on the Canberra, I rotated. As I rotated um, to about 50 feet, the instructor's seat unlocked and it just flew backwards. <laughs> and I was flying this aeroplane and this instructor, was, it was flapping around on, 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 on his seat. And uh, it was ashen, you know, because this, this seat was fully armed. It could have gone off. So I, I couldn't do much for him. So I just held the aeroplane and climbed away. And he eventually managed to get the, the seat back up and locked in position. I shouldn't laugh because it had it gone off, it would have been a messy business, really. But uh, that was my, my fourth trip in the Canberra. So what were your first thoughts of the Canberra? Like, did you like it? Yeah, it was, it was different. It was, you know, it, it had come from the NAT and it was a totally different aeroplane. We were flying the aeroplane, it was manual controls, which of course, manual controls is a bit more stiff on the controls and, and you, you can't do as much with the aeroplane, obviously not as manoeuvrable as, as a NAT, etc. So, but no, for what it was, it was a great aeroplane. And uh, I went solo on it um, and then joined up with my nav, Nobby Clark, and then we did a lot of flights together. It was just low level, really. It was getting the guy in the back who would get airborne and he'd crawl into the nose of a B2 and would do navexes around the UK. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was great fun. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So, how long did you spend on the horse EU? I think about four months, probably four or five months. Uh, yeah, it was about four or five months. Uh, um, and it was just concentrated flying the whole time at Cottesmore. Uh, so, I loved it. So, how long did you, um, how many times did you fly a week, for instance? I think probably two or three times a week, probably, I think. I can't remember the hours. I think we did about 60, 70 hours on the Canberra, probably on the OCU, uh, before we left to go to, uh, to Germany. So after the OCU, where did you get posted to? Uh, I, was, I was posted to 31 Squadron in RAF Germany. So I, I piled all my, my bags into my Mark 1 Frog Eye Sprite and headed off for Germany. I had no maps or anything like that, I just headed for Germany. So I went across the channel and arrived in Germany and I eventually found Larbrook and checked into the officer's mess. So what was the role of 31 Squadron? <coughs> 31 Squadron was obviously a, a, a recce squadron and I suppose for the, for the, for the reconnaissance squadron, um, I suppose there were three roles. There was a low level photographic role and then there was a medium level sort of vertical photography role which was sort of a, a mapping survey role and then there was a, a night flashing role which was actually night photography so those are the three roles. Well we'd take off say from, I'll, I'll go through a sort of typical trip really, we'd, we'd take off from, from Larbrook and we'd, be, we'd have planned a target and the targets generally, not as a target, but an area to, 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 to photograph and we'd, we'd either doing bridges you know or or locks or missile sites or, or or troops on the ground so what you'd do you would get airborne and then you'd fly over the the target say troops on the ground um, and and when you went flew over, over the target you'd obviously photograph it but at the same time you'd take a mental picture in your mind of what you, you saw um, at the time obviously you do that for simple reason the cameras might fail uh, or you might get battle damage, so you may not have the photographs when you get back. So when you land, landed back at Larbrook, the crews would meet the, the ground liaison officer, who was an, an army guy, and you'd do what we call it a vis rep, a visual report, and you'd sit down, you'd write down what you saw. And it's obviously fairly easy if you're doing bridges and dot locks and things like that. But once you get into the, into the field and you look at the army, it's quite a complex uh, pictures you take in your mind. You, you can have tanks, you can have all sorts of various vehicles there, and you have to identify those vehicles and put them on your vis rep. So you fill your vis rep in and then the photographs would go off to the MUFPU. The MUFPU was the mobile field photographic unit, number three photographic unit. And and you have PIs there and they'd, they'd, they'd develop the photographs and uh, they'd look through the, the 3D scopes and they could see exactly what's on the ground. And then they would, they would actually look at your vis rep and assess it against the photograph, and you were marked. So you, 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 you saw me what percent, you know, how, how right and wrong you were. After the, the guys, some of the guys there, you know, like Mike James and the guys like that, they were, they were, they're sharp cookies. They'd come back and they'd, they'd have great marks. But I was just starting out with Nobby, you know, and we were pretty amateur, really. But we did better as time went by. We got better and better and better. But I say it was only a year on the squadron. So we didn't have time to really have to really high standard like a lot of the guys there who were, who were on the squadron. 
So, can you tell us what it was like to fly the Cambrai, some of its good characteristics and bad characteristics? Well, a very stable aeroplane. You know, it's a... Uh, uh, we used to fly at 270 knots, right? 270 knots like that. Um, and really, I suppose you're limited to, that, to, to the height you flew at. I mean, you could get low. We took a lot of happy snaps down at 50 feet, you know. But obviously, Cambry, you know, you're going past the target fast, then the image is not going to be the same. You're going to get a bit blurring, and there's no image stabilization at all on the camera. So if you're taking photographs, you're taking them generally above 250 feet because you want the, a wider field of view, especially with troops on the ground. Um, and generally, uh, for the low level side of it, we'd take it from the, the left hand camera, the, the oblique camera, the F95 on the left hand side. And on the, on the side of the, of the camera, there'd be a channel of mark, which you would just run down. So you get your target, basically, the channel of mark would try and put your target a third of the way up the, of the photograph. And that's, that's what you do. Very, very high tech. <laughs> but the nav, um, you know, the nav, obviously, he, he, when you get airborne, um, he's in the back. And then he crawls down the front. It was always good fun. I'd, I'd crawl down the front, you'd just bunt over and you'd just you'd come up like this. But uh, then he'd crawl down the front and he would navigate, obviously, with a map on the front. And uh, he'd take you to the target. He'd, he'd give you directions left, right, or da da da. You'd have a map yourself, but he'd have a map and he'd take you to the target. So I've heard because it's quite a big aircraft, was it quite manoeuvrable? <laughs> I've heard stories that it is. But it is, yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember I got grounded on the first three months on the squad and, I, and my mate Jerry Yates, uh, Jerry Dent, sorry, was uh, flying at Canberra and I, I came up alongside him. And I pulled up in front of him. I did a, a barrel right round in front of him like that. Unfortunately, it wasn't Jerry, it was the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so he dragged me in and he said, uh, he gave me a, a telling off and uh, he grounded me for two weeks. <laughs> oh dear. It's probably a good lesson because I mean you you, you couldn't mess around with the Cambry. It, it wasn't it wasn't a fighter. Yeah. And you know a friend of mine sadly was, was killed doing a wing over. He, he he tried to do a bounce on somebody and he pulled up. And it was very heavy and he he just stalled in and he was killed. So it probably did me a good actually to be, to be grounded for a while. But nothing worse than me overconfident. So did you ever get bounced by other fighters and to test your skills? <laughs> Yeah, I got bounced. There was a classic one. We used to do high-level exercises as well, and there used to be star fighters there, and they come up alongside you. And uh, this star fighter, as it came alongside you, as soon as it came alongside you, you close the throttles, of course, mm. because the camera is big wing. They sit there, and the star fighter with the nose would come up, nose would come up. Eventually, you see the reheat come on you, <laughs> and far out as he as he, uh, he stopped himself stalling. So, uh, how high and fast could they fly? I know, we're up to 35,000 feet, you know, I don't know, 0 0.7, 0 0.72, I don't know what, I can't remember now, it's 45 years ago, you remember. <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, we, generally, when we're flying high level, it was just burning holes in the sky. Yeah. We used to do uh, basic training requirements, so we had to get the hours in, so we'd be up flying around, especially at night, just doing the routes at night, so yeah, about 35,000 feet, I suppose. So how many variants did you fly? Uh, the, obviously, T, the uh, T4, and the B2 and the, the PR7. Now, on one trip, uh, we were low level and, and the uh, oil pressure fell to zero, so we had to shut the right engine down. Oh, and, the, <laughs> and, the, and the camera's notorious for uh, on single engine work. The, the problem was, they used to teach you on, on when you came around final turn, you used to bring the speed back quite a lot towards VMCA. Uh, and of course, if, if speed dropped, you could actually get a situation where if you put power on, the airplane would flick. And it's a bit like the Meteor. Uh, the Meteor, they lost a lot of airplanes practicing single engine work. And I actually lost a friend sub subsequently about five years later who was practicing asymmetric work, single engine work, and the airplane flicked in. So you've got to be very careful. So on that occasion, I just came around finals a bit fast, to say the least. <laughs> you know, about 100 feet, closed both, both uh, throttles and just glid onto the runway about 2,000 foot down and just rolled to a stop. So that's my only time I had an engine fail on a camera, but it was an interesting exercise. Right, we're here with uh, 779. Did you ever fly her? Yes, uh, I flew, I think, 30 hours on, on 779. Um, just the normal low-level recce around Germany, really, um, with my nav, uh, Nobby Clark. Could you tell any missions you actually, or sorties, that you flew with 779? Uh, there were two sorties, uh, I flew 779 and it was towards the end of uh, my flying on, on uh, 31 Squadron and they were both uh, army in the field. So uh, you know, the first one was just flying through uh, the, the uh, training area, 
photographing the army, as I said before, doing a vis rep. And the second time um, is more of a flyby. So we were able to fly well, over the army about 50 feet and, and catching them all out, having a dinner or whatever, and, and photograph at the same time. And I think I've got some pictures, I think Darren's got some pictures of uh, the army sitting in the field having the lunch. So they're the two ones I remember. I looked at my logbook before I came and they're the two ones I remember. So what happened after you left the camera? <clears throat> Well, I was, I was posted on to Buccaneers, so I, I went from uh, Lowerbrook to Honington, but you don't actually start flying the, the Buccaneers straight away. And uh, after a few weeks at Honington, I was sent down to Chivener. And uh, Chivener is a place that every uh, potential fast, fast jet pilot wants to go. It's, it's a, a fabulous uh, airfield. It's down near Barnstable, uh, super weather factor. You've got uh, weapons ranges across the Bristol Channel at Pembrey. And you have the air weapons ranges just to the uh, southwest of, of Chimna. And of course, the most important thing is an airfield full of hunters. <laughs>
And then because there's no, no twin stick buck in here, there's a nav in the back there, there's no stick in the back, we do um, something like, I think, 12 or 13 simulator rides. They had a full mission simulator there, which we could actually use. So we'd do 12 or 13 simulator rides first. And from there, we'd go and fly the Hunter T7A, which is a, which is a Hunter T7 with a, a Buccaneer flight instrument system in it. And we'd do three trips on that just to get used to the, the flying the airplane around with that instrument system. After that, then, with the first trip in the Buccaneers with, with a, a QFI in the back, and uh, uh, the guy in the back of the uh, Buccaneer for me was Tom Eels. You probably heard his name. He, we referred to as Mr. Buccaneer. He, he'd done everything in the Buccaneer, uh, I, including eject. He had to eject with his navigator, doing the, exactly the same sort of exercise uh, up at Lossiemouth, and him and his navigator ejected. Anyway, so the first Buccaneer trip was with Tom Eels in the back. Lovely guy, and he, he was just very kind and spoke very gently in the back there. Didn't raise his voice, surprisingly, <laughs> because the buccaneer could be a, a bit of a pig in the circuit. Uh, so we did a circuit, landed, and it was all fine. So that was the first trip in the buccaneer, really. But Tom Eels did, all, did a lot of the uh, the, the uh, first trips in buccaneers, sitting in the back. So can you tell us how, like, how long your training lasted for and what did it entail? Uh, a training, I think the training was about six or seven months. I think we did about... Uh, 60 or 70 hours in the aeroplane, some of that. Yes, first of all, of course, you yes, sir, you flew with Tom, you did your first first flight, and then you would uh, fly with the, the staff navigators, who were very experienced guys. Uh, so you'd go off and do weapons, weapons, etc., uh, with those guys there. And then you'd crew it with your, with your own navigator, and I crewed it with my nav, Les Gibson, who I flew with uh, in total over the next few years, 380 times, so it was a lot of... You know, once you crewed up with some, you stay with them, and that was your constituted crew. So that's what we did. We we spent a lot of time together flying uh, low-level navexes up and down the the east coast of UK. We used to drop bombs at Waynefleet, Cowden Range, uh, up to Tain Range occasionally, and Holbeach Range down south. So we did a lot of weaponry uh, or dropping bombs uh, on the east coast, and of course a lot of navigation and the, the Buccaneer really was designed for the Navy it was designed effectively to, to toss a nuclear weapon onto a sphere loft cruiser you know and so the the navigation and the weapon system the integrated weapon system was designed really for that in mind so the navs were superb they, they adapted the system and they got used to the system for going over land and it, it was it was it was a, a satisfactory system but they uh, they had to interpret it all the time yeah, instead of an inertial nav system, they had a master reference gyro, that's it, which, which powered the, the weapon system. And it tended to uh, slip and, and whatever, so it wasn't as accurate as, as you would expect an inertial nav to be. So the navs were superb, they interpreting the information. And of course, they used to use a map uh, all the time as well for the target runs. So that was it. We, we did a lot of what they called uh, SAPs, which is a, a simulated, simulated attack profile, which is where you do... You'd, plan the attack, obviously not draw weapons, but you simulate the weren't dropping weapons. So when you first stepped into the cockpit, how did it differ to the camera? <laughs> well, first of all, you know, it, it weren't seen to one side of the the uh, aeroplane, and the view is actually superb. The, the, the nose drops away in front of you, so you can see down in front. The nav, of course, he's sitting to one side, so he can see down the front as well. So it's a vastly different aeroplane obviously the camera big straight wheel aeroplane with no power controls and the Buccaneer was fully power controlled so it was a vastly different aeroplane and a vastly different power as well the engines of the uh, spay engines on the Buccaneer were a lot more powerful the Avons on the camera. So could you tell us a bit about your time on the OCU what did what what did it involve that a day in life would be great? Well a day in life on the OCU really was when you arrived to work, as a, as a crew, you'd be given a task to do. Uh, my nab, Les Gibson. So you'd sit down and, and plan the task, which would be uh, planning it on a map. And, and uh, when you're doing SAPs, you'd be doing, plan a, a target, uh, IP initial point to target run. And you both have a, have a copy of the map. And then you, you get airborne and you fly the profile, uh, low level uh, or high level, then, then low level. And then come back to Honington for a full debrief with the the uh, instructors back at Honington. So what happened after the OCU? Where did you get posted to? Um, from the OCU, uh, I was posted to 16 Squadron. And uh, when I arrived there, of course, there was no, no aeroplanes on 16 Squadron. 
uh, it, the uh, 16 uh, camera squad had, had shut down and they are just a, an empty hangar really. So for about three months we just prepared the hangar ready for the aeroplanes to arrive. Um, I think it was three or four months. We just planned briefing rooms and we had set up NBC facilities, nuclear, biolog biological and chemical facilities, so that we could actually operate in a wartime environment. So all that was set up prior to the aeroplanes arriving in about, was it, 1972? I think it was 72, 72, 72 yeah. Did the thought scare you, the whole nuclear thing? And you might have to drop a bomb? <clears throat> no, not really. I mean, the whole point about nuclear deterrent was that... Uh, you know, a nuclear weapon is a weapon of last resort. So, you know, we never thought we were ever going to have to, to actually drop the weapon. The idea being that we were a very effective squadron and we were very effective at what we were doing. And that's what was the deterrent. That was the whole point about it, really. So what was the role of 16 Squadron? <clears throat> Well, uh, we just mentioned really that the, the 16 Squadron, the, the, the Buccaneer obviously had a, a strike capability when we, we tend to revert to, refer to strike as the nuclear side of it, uh, nuclear strike capability. And the, the weapon we used on the Buccaneer was a WE-177 weapon, nuclear weapon, uh, with a yield of about 10 kilotons, if I remember rightly, which is about half the size of the bomb that was dropped on, on Nagasaki. Uh, so we would actually, the idea would be that we'd fly into the target and about four miles uh, before the target we would do a toss attack and we would lob this nuclear weapon uh, towards the target and it would be on a, on a parachute or on a, a retarded. And the idea was being that the, the, the weapon would uh, be an airburst. An airburst meant that the, the fireball doesn't touch the ground, so it's as a tactical weapon, it means that the fireball goes up and you get very little uh, residual, residual fallout. So that in theory, obviously it would never happen, in theory, you, you're not, the area is not being contaminated with the radioactive fallout, so you, your troops can actually go straight through. And that's why they were able to build Nagasaki and Hiroshima so quickly, is because it was an airburst, and whilst it devastated, a terrible devastation, there wasn't a lot of residual radiation. If you look at the thing about Chernobyl, where there's a lot of fallout from the, the reactor there, that's, that area now is unusable for years and years and years. So that's when an airburst was. It, it was, a, it was a terrible weapon, don't get me wrong. It was a, you know, the, the burst from the, the, uh, the weapon, obviously there's a massive fireball and there's radiation from the fireball and the fireball will go upwards, but the, the blast will go down. It's like a tennis ball, it hits the ground and the bottom of the fireball, bottom of the uh, blast would go upwards again. So you get a, an outward movement of the, the blast wave and a reflected blast wave as well. So uh, when it hit the ground, it just wipe out anything. So it was a devastating weapon, and that's why it was such a good deterrent. I mean, the, the thought of chucking one of those nuclear weapons at uh, targets, you know, troops, whatever, on the ground were just devastating. So kept the peace, you know, that's what we do. And that's the whole point of deter deterrence, really. So, Ken, were there any incidents on 16 Squadron? Well, we used to fly low around uh, Germany all the time, obviously, and uh, most of our flying was um, doing SAPs, as I said before, simulated attack profiles. Um, so we would, we would fly a target, um, attack the target, uh, dive attack, and often we'd then leave that target and we'd then fly through Nordhorn range and drop some bombs. So our whole life was generally flying around uh, Germany low level, between 250 knots, 250 feet, and 500 feet, generally about 200 feet, 250 feet. Um, and we'd use Nordhorn range. And what we used to do, of course, we'd have a time on target. So you'd do your saps. And then you'd have what's called a first run attack. So you'd fly through Nordhorn range at a time. So um, I, was, I was flying low level with Les Gibson and we, we were a bit behind time for our first run attack. And we, we got up to about uh, 540 knots, about 200 feet. And we, we hit a crane. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> yeah, not that sort of crane with a hook on the end, but a, a crane that was oh, doing this. You know, oh, yeah, right, yes, right. yeah. <laughs> And, you know, it was trying to avoid the aeroplane, you know, but he went straight on the right hand engine and the engine just stopped. So we, uh, we returned to, to Larbrook. And it's not like a Canberra that the Buccaneer is fairly easy to fly on one engine, plenty of power, there's no asymmetric problem at all. I went back to Larbrook and uh, landed there. Uh, obviously, an engine change. There wasn't much left of the engine, really, so it, was, it almost t totally destroyed the engine. And the crane's not small, though. It's not, you know, it, went, it actually dented all the intake as well as it went in with its, its yeah, wings out like this, yeah, yeah. Was it aircraft saveable, or was it just the engines that needed? It was just the engine, yeah, just change the change the, end, change the spare, yeah, yeah. I left Germany, RAF Germany, and we went to uh, uh, to 2A Squadron. Uh, 
and I joined it by the navigator John Broadbent, um, and we joined, so we joined Tour Escort. And, and the role of Tour Escort, Tour Escort was totally different to Germany. As I said before, Germany was a very defined role. Uh, Tour Escort and there were, is, is the northern theatre of, of NATO, and you're really looking at the northern Denmark, and then Norway, all the way up Norway, up the Kola Peninsula. Um, so we, we weren't really a, a sort of having an interdiction role, really. We were really more of a airfield denial role. Um, if you can think about it, uh, Norway's a, a long way away, so it's very difficult for, for two A squad to actually, actually operate in Norway. So what we'd do, we would actually obviously operate in the UK and occasionally go to Norway. But to, to, to go to Norway, of course, you need to refuel. And that's where the, the tanking came into it. Air to air refueling. So on two eight squadron, we'd start up, we'd go off uh, initially and we would join the, the tanker. A tanker, a Victor tanker, uh, you'd, you'd sit on station, you're doing a, um, um, a standard racetrack pattern, uh, the tanker would, and we'd just join up on the left hand wing. And then we'd drop down behind the tanker. And then, obviously, with the the probe here, there's the effect of the of the nose uh, uh, on the the basket of the of the tanker. So what we'd do, you'd actually you come up behind the the, the the drogue, and you'd put the the probe there in about the one o'clock position. Then you'd move forward. As you move forward, the airflow over the nose of the airplane would, would push the the uh, drogue up, and you just plug in. When you're plugged in. You'd actually then move forward. I think it was a, there was a band, it was a red band or a green band, a red band, which you'd move forward until the red band went into the um, refueling pod. And once you got it, the red band was in the refueling pod, the fuel would start flowing. So you actually flew along, maintaining that distance so the fuel flowed. And then you'd pull off, and then the other guy would come out and refuel. Um, it, it was never a relaxing exercise. We never did enough of it, really. And of course, is it fairly easy when the guys were flying straight and level on the racetrack? But of course, they'd say clear to join in the turn. So the, the Victor tank was in a turn like that. So you'd actually join in the turn, which is always interesting, of course. And once we'd achieved doing it in the daytime, we would end up then doing it at night. Uh, it was always good fun exercise doing tanking at night. Scary, Scary was, was the right word for it because you'd, you'd go off at night. Uh, a uh, gin clear night, you'd have the stars above you, you'd have the North Sea or rigs beneath you, so the lights everywhere, and they'll say clear to join the turn. So you're, you're joining the bloody turn, and you're, you're in like this, and you're, you've got the stars up there and the stars down here, and you'd, you'd come in and join and plug in, get your fuel. And then when you came out, of course, the dis it's enormously disorientating, you know, because you've got the clear skies and, and, the, and the, the lights beneath you, and you pull off and then drop back. But night, night refueling was uh, an interesting exercise. I didn't have to do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can tell I'm a pilot, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you also operated the Buccaneer in Red Flag. How did this happen? Well, what happened was that uh, I was on 2A Squadron and uh, John Robin, John Robert and I uh, were asked to go on to the QWI course, which is a pretty pretty comprehensive course on the Buccaneers, a very, a very difficult course, very pedantic course. It's a course whereby you, you're expected to have to be perfection the whole time with, with your briefings and your board work, your briefings, your debriefings and your flying all the rest of it. So it's, it's a throwback to the Navy, it's an incredibly difficult course to do. Well I was on the QWI course with John and, and two eight Scott were, were, were sent out to Red Flag and because they were going out to Red Flag, we were, the QWI course was attached to two eight Scott to go out to Red Flag. Uh, so we flew out uh, uh, with them to, uh, to uh, Nellis Air Force Base and we, we operate a, a different unit really, there were, there were eight of us, there were two instructors and there was three pairs. I, said, I, was, I was lucky with my name, John Broadbent, Broadbent. So we arrived out in, in Red Flag and of course the Americans couldn't believe it. You know. <laughs> These buccaneers arrived over there and they looked pretty archaic compared with you know the f-15s the f-16s even the f-5s you know the, the americans would like so um and of course they they got quickly got uh, uh aware of the fact it was called the banana bomber so they they love calling it the banana bomber do you know why it's called the banana bomber is it because it looks kind of like a no that's that's where people get wrong oh, it, it's actually when it, it designed it, it was called the blackburn naval aircraft the bna then it became the blackburn advanced naval aircraft, the BNA, BNA. 
So then the BNA bomber, Barna bomber, banana bomber, that's how it came about. So nothing to do with a bloody banana. So anyway, that's the way it is. Uh, so yeah, so a, a red flag and, um, you know, a very intense, intense, uh, I think two or three weeks he was there. Uh, I think a lot of people have heard about it, the Buccaneers flying low level and doing well. But I, I don't think the story's ever been really told that it's only half the story of what, what you know, flying low level. And the other half story is, is, is the navigators. The navigators were superb. You know, they made red flag. And, uh, and I'll, I'll just go through and explain to you sort of a, a typical mission, if you like. I'll do, go through that. Um, we'd arrive in the morning at the beginning of our task. Say we're given an air fuel attack. Say, you know, tossing a, a, a thousand pounder, tossing a stick of thousand pounders. We only toss one. Tossing a thousand pounder. Someone coming through for a lay down attack, then a couple of guys doing a couple of dive attacks um, to take out the infrastructure. The lay down attack would try and take out the runway, laying a stick of bombs down. So you'd, you'd plan, the, you'd plan the, uh, the, the, the coordinated attack. And the coordinated attack relied enormously on, on the timeline, is that you would you'd pick your, your, your IPs for the, t for the target, and obviously you want to try and come in different directions to, to confuse the enemy. And then you'd work backwards, you know, you, you, you often you, you can work in a few timing points where you can delay or pick up time, whatever, and then you'd, you'd work the route back. So we'd be planning that, the, 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 we'd plan the route, the nav, my nav would plan the route and we'd, we'd, we'd delegate the other navigators to plan their uh, IP to target. Uh, I, I, if I was leading the formation, would prepare the briefing, etc. And then we'd, we'd brief the mission, we'd brief what we're going to do and then walk out the airplanes and get airborne, get airborne in two pairs and <clears throat> would fly uh, to the, the uh, exercise area at about five, ten thousand feet, I don't know what it was, in battle formation. And then we'll descend into the, into the tactical area and we'll descend low level, say that to about 100 feet initially. And then as we came towards, the, we were flying over the desert, flat desert, as we came to the, the, the cap area where you've got a combat air patrol in front of you, we'll descend down to about 10 feet, something like that, about five, 550 knots. Uh, but we found that, you know, that uh, at that height, we were actually leaving dust trails a bit, so we just climbed up a bit to 20 feet, something like that, to, to, so we didn't leave any dust trails. So you, we, we, we'd, we'd see the cat, we'd see the airplanes, and, and you couldn't, at 20 feet, they couldn't touch you really. You couldn't get a gun to kill with a lead on the, on the gun. And a missile, even as far as you would probably hit the ground before it hit you anyway. So they, they couldn't get a kill at any time, the, the fighters on, on the Buccaneers. So, as I said you, the navigators of the battle course, they were monitoring all this, we were going high speed, 540 knots, and they were running the timeline, they are keeping an eye on the, the time on the target. We had a time on target, we had to make the time on target, and when we got the target, we had to have spacing on the target, you had 30 seconds spacing, say, on toss the weapon, then you'd have somebody coming through and you lay down 30 seconds later. So, the time was, was crucial, really, for the attacks. So anyway, we, we, we would uh, progress along the desert, and then we came up towards the hills there, and the the fighters would expect us to, to if that was a hill there, would, to, to climb up and push over the top like that, and the, the fighter would come down behind and try and get a sky shot. You were actually skylining it, and they would try and get a sky shot like that. But the buccaneer didn't, buccaneer didn't do that. The buccaneer would come up to a hill, as that as it was a hill, instead of skying out there, the buccaneer would just come up the hill and go to the top, about 50 feet over the hill, and pull down the valley there. So, pulling about four or five feet over the top, down in, in, into the valley. And this is where the navigators, again, they were superb, you know, keeping pace of what was going on, because the, the kit in the back wasn't wonderful. The nav kit, uh, as I mentioned before, it was designed, uh, you know, for the Navy, really. So, uh, they were key, the lead navigator would be keeping an eye on what was going on the whole time. All the other navigators were aware of what was going on. If you got severely delayed or, or whatever, you could always retime it by saying time so and so, and everybody else would take the time from that. So then we'd, we'd attack the airfield, and of course, you, you're going through, once you've gone through the cap, you've got the, the missile sites you're flying through, and of course, you're flying pretty low, you know, you're down 50, 20, 30 feet, so your know, missiles tend to point upwards, not downwards. So, <laughs> uh, so, you know, and so they, they, they had no chance, really. And then you, you, you came to your target, so the lead guy would toss his weapon. And of course, the thing about tossing a weapon is that on a medium toss is that you, you toss the weapon, as soon as the better weapons have gone, you pull into a hard pull down at 4 or 5G, 150 degrees of bank. So there's no chance of a missile, you know, the, the airplane's moving so much. 
And then there's a lay-down attack where you would drop a, a stick of bombs, say. The idea of a lay-down attack was that you'd drop, say, four bombs with a, a spacing. You never flew down the runway to, to take out a runway. You always flew about 30 degrees to it. So you can guarantee you maybe got one bomb on the runway. If you flew down the runway, all the bombs would go to the right or left of the runway, you see. So that's the idea of a stick of, of uh, bombs. So lay down attack. And then the guys who came in to do the, uh, the, the uh, shallow angle dive bombing would pull up again and the airplane was moving all the time. So the chance of being shot down by a missile were very remote. So they'd drop their bombs and they'd scoot out. The guy that had the hard time, of course, was the, was the guy doing a lay-down attack. Um, and the difficult lay-down was that you were limited to your heart. You couldn't, you couldn't come in really low level on a lay-down attack. Every weapon on an airplane or a missile, when it leaves a missile launch or when the bomb leaves the airplane, is not armed. A missile, when it's launched, it, it's armed when it accelerates to a certain speed. On a bomb, um, a retard bomb, when you drop the bomb, there's, there's an arming vein on the back and it arms the bomb and it needs 130 feet to arm. So you have to find level, minimum about 150 feet. And a classic example of this is in the Falklands War, I, I don't know if you remember that, the BBC showing the pictures of these A4 Skyhawks coming down the bay. And I was in Glasgow at the time, I was like flying from Monarch Airlines. And I saw these pictures and as soon as I saw them I thought, I can't believe that because these airplanes are coming low and dropping their bomb and they weren't going off. And they weren't going off because they were too low. So thanks to the BBC, of course, the audience said, oh, that's great, our bombs aren't going off. So what they did, they changed their attack to, to shallow dive bombing with 500 pound retard, bo retard, retard bombs. And that's what Trigala Sagana had. Anyway, you know, uh, that's a different story. So anyway, so yes, so 150 feet is the minimum you can drop a, a thousand pound bomb from. And from there, you'd reform, and then you'd uh, go around area, area 51, which is the most secret place in America, avoiding Area 51 and we would come round and we would do a running break and land. We'd then go in and, and, and debrief ourselves, just the, the, the eight of us would debrief ourselves and then we would uh, later would go into the mass debrief and that's everybody from the, that morning, those missions were there, all the Americans were there and you'd go in there and all these guys sitting there, their smart tailored flying suits you know and their, their Ray-Bans and their bloody baseball hats, all the rest of it. <laughs> And you'd go in there in your Aria flying suit with great salt stains down the side. <laughs> and you'd, st you'd stand up there and you'd say, this is, this is the mission we did. And you'd say, we, we flew low level and under the cap and we went down over the hills and we attacked the target on time and we dropped our weapons and we recovered back to, to Nellis Air Force Base. And then they'd say to me, okay, uh, they asked the aggressor squadrons, anybody got a missile or a, 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 a guns kill? No. And then they asked the, the, uh, the, the uh, missile sites, anybody get a missile kill? No. And it was great. <laughs> and, and the Americans, of course, they'd have gone, whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah. Of course, being the Air Force, we said, uh, thank you very much, and just walked away. <laughs> so it was great. I mean, it, they were quite impressed with the Buccaneer. And, but the point I'm making is that you know, it wasn't just about pilots flying low level. It, the navigators had a massive input into, into Red Flag. And I don't think they often get the, the press they deserve. You know, it was a crew airplane. And these guys have been flying together a lot, the, the crews, the constituted crews. And to maintain a timeline and to be able to get hit a target on time was an enormous skill. And that was down to the navigators. So you couldn't have done the job without the navigator? No, 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 no. And, and uh, I say, it, was, it wasn't a design for the bucket, for the overland roll, the, the, the integrated weapon system. So, you know, they did a, a superb job. Um, so that was it. Yeah, that was Red Flag. And we all enjoyed it. We had a bit of time down in Las Vegas, obviously, and we had a few parties. And it was, it was just a, a superb time. It was a, an opportunity to fly extremely low level and get some good results. So once we finished Red Flag, I was still on the QWI course and we, we had a great time. Uh, we went back to Honington and we had another week or 10 days flying low level, doing all the stuff that the QWIs do, do. And when we finished the course, John and I went back to 2A Squadron and uh, what happened then was that uh, the, the, the weapons leader got promoted, it got moved on to being a, a flight commander and I was asked to take over a weapons leader on the squadron. John went off in his own way, he went off to fly with, with other people and I ended up flying with a lot of the navigators on the squadron because obviously as a weapons leader I had to fly with everybody. Although I was crewed up with Al Vincent and uh, with Al I uh, flew 431, you know, uh, quite a few times. 431 actually flew in red flag, I flew it in red flag. 
Um, and then my final flight was on 431 in on 28 squadron. So, you know, that's my final aeroplane over there. I flew on the Canberra, and this is the final Buccaneer I flew here on 28 squadron. So overall, did you enjoy your time on the Buccaneer? Oh yes. I mean, it was the most th thrilling experience you ever know, imagined. Really, it, uh, you could do no more than we did on the Buccaneer, apart from land on an aircraft carrier, which some guys did. You know, they obviously went off to the Navy, but I don't think I've done any more on the Buccaneer than I did. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And how many hours did you acquire on the Buccaneer? 1,200, something like that, 1,200, something like that. Yeah, it was mad. Um, with John, I like I said, with Les, I did 380 missions with, uh, with uh, 350 missions with Les. I did about 280 with John. So, you, you know, it's, it's, you, you, you fly with a guy you trust yeah. as, a, as a crew, you know, and that's what makes the Buccaneers so successful because you fly as a constituted crew. Um, so, yeah, I loved it. So, my last flight on the Buccaneer was with, with um, Al Vincent and we, we led two F-104s to Salisbury Plain, and then we came, they, they, the Dutch 104s, they, they broke off and went back to Holland, and I came back and did a bit of a fly past the airfield. And one of the famous pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was just descending past the tower, you know, to fly down the, the apron there, yeah. 15, 10, 10, gear down, and then just did a circuit and landed, really, but that was our last flight on a Buccaneer. Brilliant. So, Ken, do you have any hobbies? Uh, yes, I, 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 I was a trained engineer, so I've always been interested in engineering. So I got myself a little MGTD car, which I, I brought back to South Africa many, many years ago. And I've been rebuilding it, but I've been rebuilding it for a long time. Um, I'm still fiddling around with it. I've probably got another few months to go before it's back on the road again. So that's really my main hobby, I suppose. Also, I, I, I got five dogs, so you know, they, they get pretty involved with those as well. So. Busy. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a favourite aircraft? Uh, I suppose the two. I mean, I, I, the Buccaneer is my favourite aeroplane for, for the Royal Air Force, and of course, I I did 33 years in civil aviation with the Monarch Airlines, and I flew the 757 for 27 years, and, and the 767. So I suppose the 757 and 767 are my best. I enjoy flying those, and but the Buccaneer, obviously, I think is my probably my most favourite aircraft. I suppose. Is there an aircraft you wish you could have flown? No, no. I mean, I, I, I look back to the days when I, I met Kevin Mace you know, in the Merchant Navy and he was in a valley and uh, I looked to think well, that I'd love to go to valley and, and do that. And I've, I look back at my journey through um, the Air Force, you know, the, 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 the Nats and the, the Canberra and the Buccaneer and the Hunter, you know, and uh, I think Jensen Button tomorrow is, is, is uh, doing his last race uh, in Formula One and he, on his helmet he just says, the journey is the reward. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that sums it all up. You know, it's the journey through the training, through the squadrons, is the reward. And I don't look back and think that I would uh, like to fly anything else. Yes, I'd love to, I suppose, lightning or all that sort of stuff, but I didn't. I, I did the most I could do with the airplanes I flew. Uh, I thought it was superb. Do you get to air shows? Occasionally, not, not very often these days, unfortunately. There's not many air shows, are there, really? I, I've been to Bronte, you know, Bronte and Thorpe, seeing the guys down there. So, no, not really, no. So, how much do involvement do you have with 779 and 431? Well, well I try and help when I can. Obviously, I, I don't, these guys put a lot of work into these aeroplanes, and I can't do much for that, but I help them out when I can. Whatever I can do, I'll help them out yeah. with, you know. So, I've, I've done, done one or two things for them, you know. So, uh, they do such a great job because <clears throat> aeroplanes tend to, you know, go into museums in London or whatever, but these aeroplanes aren't in museums. They are. These guys have bought these aircraft, they spend their own money on them, and they drag them around various air shows, whatever, and kids can sit in them. You look over there now, there are kids in the, in the Buccaneer, you know. So, it's, it, it, you know, maybe one of these, these kids here see these aeroplanes and think, yes, I want to be a pilot, I want to join the Air Force, or whatever. So, it inspires them to do that. So, I think they, they do a great, great job, you know, Andrew and, 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 and Darren, and all the other guys as well. So it must be nice actually seeing the aircraft you actually flew rather than just a Canberra or a Buccaneer. The actual ones you flew must be lovely. Well, I mean, it's unique. I mean, you think about it. I've uh, flew this aeroplane. It was the last aeroplane I flew in the Air Force. And the Buccaneer was the last Buccaneer I flew in the Air Force. So you can imagine, you know, it's, it's great to have them around. And finally, do you ever get sick about talking about aviation? <laughs> <laughs> Flying aeroplanes for 45 years, you know, so, uh, you know, not really. Pilots never get sick of talking about flying aeroplanes. <laughs> <laughs>